Another distinctive is the eschaton, meaning the second coming of Christ in the future. The whole um, church caught up in that expectation that the Jesus who came and lived among us back there 2,000 years ago is returning again. He keeps returning through the work of the Holy Spirit indeed, but this conviction that he will return and fulfill the kingdom that he began back there when he walked the streets and byways of Galilee and Judea so many years ago. And so the whole Christian movement is permeated with this sense of hope and expectation that Christ is coming back again that the kingdom that he initiated when he was on earth will be fulfilled in his second coming. You know, <clears throat> shortly I'll be talking, shortly I will be talking about the African worldview in regards to history, where you come from the past into the present and return to the past like that. Later in this class, we're going to talk about the Islamic view of history, where we come from paradise to return to paradise. But history just hangs. It's not going in any direction. It's just awaiting the final judgment. Or we will talk about Confucianism, which says, look to the past. The past is what history is about and what we should emulate. It's a view of history which, again, with no movement forward, idealizing the past and the way of the ancestors in the past, looking in that direction. Or shortly, we'll be talking about the Buddhist and the Hindu view of history, which is that history goes round and round and round and round and round and round with no purpose at all, cyclical. Or we might take some time, uh, we might not get time for it, but we might take some time later in the class, the course, to look at uh, Greek, uh, Greek philosophy, which again says that history goes round and round, linked to, bound to, the cycles of nature. Just as nature dies in the wintertime and then resurrects in the summertime, so all of history has that cyclical pattern, and each one of us, in turn, are tied to that cycle of the gods who resurrect and die and resurrect and die and resurrect and die and resurrect and die going in no direction whatsoever. These different views of history are very, very intriguing. They all relate to that ultimate question, what am I here for? What's it all about, you see? But in biblical faith, in biblical faith, uh, it's, it, none of these, none of these uh, pictures de uh, describe what, uh, what the Bible says about all of this. Within biblical faith, uh, history begins in a garden, Adam and Eve in the garden, and it goes in a direction towards the fulfillment of God's kingdom. That God is about the business of rectifying the horrible consequences of our rebelling against God and our sinfulness. God is at work to bring about a new creation in the fulfillment of his kingdom. And so within the biblical view, there is this expectation always looking forward towards the messianic coming, the messianic reign of Christ when he returns again, and eventually in the fulfillment of his kingdom in the conclusion of history. The last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, describe this grand city that God is building toward which all of creation, towards which all of history is moving, looking forward with expectation. The eschaton, in the future, Christ is returning again to fulfill his kingdom. In our churches, uh, Sunday after Sunday, we pray a prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then, the blockbuster, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does that mean? It means, God, we know you're going to fulfill your kingdom, that you're in the process of bringing that about. We see it on every hand, your work in bringing about your kingdom. So we're standing on our tiptoes, expecting that kingdom to be fulfilled. But don't just, we don't want to just wait to the future for that to happen. Might your kingdom be fulfilled right now in the life uh, of our congregation. May signs of your kingdom be present among us. May we live your kingdom as we go through this coming week, expecting your second coming when it will be fulfilled, but rejoicing that it is happening now as well. Your kingdom come, 
uh, your will be done now in our congregation, in our lives, in our families, as it will be fulfilled in the future when you return again. So wherever the church goes around the world and proclaims the gospel, it proclaims a message of hope, of expectation, that God will bring about the fulfillment of his kingdom. It's a hope-filled movement, the Christian movement, the biblical movement, uh, which is absolutely amazing. And then there is the church, a most remarkable community. For the church is a community looking forward to this future when Jesus returns again, but as we said just a minute ago, also living in constant prayer and expectation that the kingdom will keep breaking through also right now, that we will begin to taste, that we will be tasting signs of that future when Jesus returns again. And so the churches around the world, they worship within local idiom and local culture and local expressions, but also part of a universal worldwide fellowship of believers. It will break the bread and share the communion, which is a universal emblem. Churches all over the world do that, participating in a worldwide fellowship. But then in the prayers, as the bread is broken, the prayers are local prayers. Every language group praying the prayers in their own idiom, in their own language, and so forth. So it's both universal and it is local. Um, occasionally, I'm impressed with how the United Nations invites the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church to come and address the United Nations. Why do they do that? It's a recognition by the world community of nations that the Church, Catholic case, a billion strong, is a universal community, but it's also local. That's what the United Nations is reaching for, to be a community of nations which respects all nations, but also participates in a worldwide discussion, political discussion. That's the United Nations. And when they look for a community, a spiritual community that represents that quest they turn to the church, to a messenger from the church, you see, to speak to the United Nations when they're looking at spiritual foundations for what they're attempting to do politically in the United Nations. It's quite impressive. The church, local and also universal. An amazing community. And a community in which God's grace is shared and experienced. Not only does the church gather in Jesus' name, but it is also a community in mission. Remember God's promise to Abraham, through your seed, through your spiritual descendants, all nations will be blessed. And the church believes it is called to carry forward that commitment to blessing the nations. And so the church moves from community to community, from nation to nation, from culture to culture, by God's grace, seeking to extend the blessing of God upon cultures and peoples everywhere. The church in mission. And the conviction that God's plan is that every language on earth, every people on earth, hear the gospel as God plans, brings to pass his grand plan for the consummation of all of history in the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I slipped another one in here as I travel. I hear people talk about Christian marriage being distinctive or the Christian commitment to, to, uh, to uh, singleness, the vocation of singleness. In many, many cultures, you just have to get married. There's no alternative. Everyone has to get married because the view is that the function of womanhood is to produce children. And so every woman has to get married. Mar singleness is not an option. But in the Christian movement, either male and female singleness or marriage is an option. We have our fulfillment, therefore, not in marriage or in singleness, but in a right and joyous relationship with God. And marriage becomes a sign of God's covenant relationship with humankind, uh, a sacred sign, a covenant sign 
a sign which is not to be broken, is to be preserved and nurtured um, and, um, and respected. S Christian singleness and Christian marriage are distinctive gifts that uh, the church in so many parts of the world offers to societies. As for example, the story I told you of Wakuru and Yakitumo among the Zanaki people. The gospel itself, the good news that religion never saves anyone. It is God in Christ who saves us. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. The good news of the gospel. We don't save ourselves. Our religions don't save ourselves. I was reading one theologian recently who said some religions give a little bit of salvation and others give a lot of salvation. That's not biblical. Uh, we are not saved by our religiosity. It is God who initiates our salvation. We are saved through God's act in Christ. Salvation is his gift to us, not religion. And so uh, all believers know that they are redeemed by God's grace, not by a particular religious um, system that we embrace. And very related to that then is our concluding comment, and that is the kingdom of God. God's reign has begun, and the church is called to be a sign of that reign and a witness that God's plan is that in his own time and way, his kingdom will be fulfilled. And so the church, I like to think of the church as, as congregations that are all looking forward to that future. So the church becomes con congregations of the future looking forward to that time when the kingdom will be fulfilled forever and ever, expectantly, waiting, pushing forward. God's going to bring it about. When and how, we don't know, but we know it is already coming now in our local congregations. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Some years ago, I was at a mosque in Philadelphia, and uh, uh, we were, as I do many times, we were talking around the circle, about 30 of us Christians and about 40, 50 Muslims. And then the Muslims said, in the Christian faith, you believe that Jesus is coming back again. I said, that's right. What will happen when he comes? What will it be like when he comes? Well, I said, that kingdom that he will fulfill when he returns again is already happening now. So come and take a look. Visit our churches and you will see the kingdom already happening. The marriages are being healed. Drug addicts are being re rescued from the tragedy of their drug addiction. Uh, the farms are being cared for. Even the cows are happy for they're being cared for well by the farmers where the kingdom is already happening among us. So come and visit our churches. You'll see a show and tell of the future when Jesus comes back again to fulfill his kingdom. And so would you believe it? A group of these Muslims decided to accept that invitation. And so several carloads of them came to our area, to our community, and spent a weekend on one occasion, worshiping in our churches, observing the church in worship, going to our farms, visiting in our homes, eating our food, and seeing signs of the kingdom of God happening now that will be fulfilled when Jesus returns again. So the church is a community of the future, but also a community of the present. For the kingdom of God will be fulfilled in future when Jesus returns, but it's already happening now. And that is a very exciting expectation.